This video is all about how to interpret the four different types of pedigree charts that you'd likely see on a form exam by LB30. Um, I've picked four typical pedigree charts, and what we need to determine for each one of these is what is the mode of inheritance of the trait. Now, what we mean by mode of inheritance of the trait is uh, is the trait inherited due to a dominant or recessive allele? And is the trait on the X chromosome or not on the X chromosome? If it's on the X chromosome, we call it X-linked or sex-linked. If it's not on the X chromosome, well, then we call it autosomal. So, uh, first thing is to figure out if the um, pedigree chart represents a dominant or recessive trait. So let's take a look at this one. I'll call this pedigree chart number one. And on pedigree chart number one, I can see that there are six individuals, one, two, three, four, five, six individuals that have the trait. And I can see that um, each individual with the trait has a parent who has the trait. So for example, individual 3, 2 has a parent with the trait. That's individual 2, 2. Individual 2, 2 has at least one parent. Well, both parents in this case have the trait. And I can't see any exception to that rule. I can see that in every single instance, if somebody with the trait, this person has the trait, the parent has the trait. This person has the trait, at least one parent has the trait. So if I could find even one example where that wasn't true, I'd have to assume that this is a recessive trait. But I can't find any examples of that, so I'm going to assume for now that this is a dominant trait. Now, I can't be absolutely 100% sure. I can just say it's most likely a dominant trait because all it would take is one individual that doesn't fit the pattern and we would have to assume it's recessive. For example, if this individual right here, we fill in that square, well now we have an individual, individual 3, 8, where there is a parent with neither one of them has a trait, which means that would force it to be a recessive trait. It would have to be a recessive trait in that instance. But because that's not the case here, we don't have any examples of that, then we can be fairly certain that this is a dominant trait. So let's look over here at pedigree, and I'll call this one pedigree chart number two. In pedigree chart number two, I look at individual 4-1, and individual 4-1, neither parent has the trait. Since neither parent has the trait, I know this has to be a recessive trait. Now, this one it's not a matter of, it's most likely recessive. No, this has to be recessive. The only way an individual like this individual, 4 or 1, could have the trait um, and the parent not have the trait is if this is a recessive. So it's very easy to find if the trait is recessive. Um, for the dominant, we have to kind of make assumptions based on what we can see. So if we take a look at, we'll call this pedigree number 3. If we look at this one, I'm looking at every individual with the trait, and I can't see any examples of an individual with the trait where a parent doesn't have the trait. Any individual with the trait that I see, for example, if I look at 2, 4, well, a parent has the trait. If I look at, I'm just picking some random ones here, uh, 2, 12, parent has the trait. 4, 4, parent has the trait. And there's no exception to that, so I can conclude that this is most likely a dominant trait. Whatever the trait is that's being uh, depicted in this pedigree chart, it's due to a dominant allele or a capital letter allele. Now, let's take a look at the last one we have here, number four. In number four, well, I can immediately see some instances where an individual has the trait and neither parent has the trait. For example, individual two, three, neither parent has the trait which means this must be recessive. I don't need to go any further. I don't need any more examples. Because if I find even one where an individual has a trait and neither parent has it, it's definitely due to a recessive allele. That means a lowercase n. All right, so that's the first part of interpreting pedigree charts, figuring out whether they're dominant or recessive. The second part is to figure out whether it's located on the X chromosome, in other words, X-linked, or not on the X chromosome. We call that autosomal. So, first of all, we need some rules here. And it's actually easier to figure out the rules on the re recessive pedigree chart. So I'm going to look at pedigree chart number two uh, and pedigree chart number four. Now, the rule is for a recessive trait, if it's going to be X-linked, it's got to be more common in females, I'm sorry, 
I'll start that again. It's got to be more common in males than in females. Now, in this first category chart, number two here, what I see here is that we've got one male and two females. Now, we would expect it to be more common in males if it was a recessive trait than in females. And one male and two females really isn't enough for us to conclude that it is um, anything other than autosomal. But there's another clue here to tell me that it is not X-linked. The other clue is individual 4-1. Individual 4-1 is a female with the trait. And if we think about how um, X-linked traits are inherited, a female must get an X-linked trait, an X-linked allele from both her mother and her father. Well, for an X-linked trait, her father only has one X chromosome, and it would have to be the recessive allele, and he would have to have the trait if his daughter's going to have it. So if a female has the trait, her father must also have the trait, and he does not. So that tells me this cannot be an X-linked trait. This must be autosomal. So not only is it recessive, it is autosomal. There are two good clues that it's autosomal. Number one, there are not more males and females with the trait. And number two, a female with the trait. Her father does not have the trait, therefore it cannot be excellent. So we can conclude that pedigree chart number two is recessive and autosomal. Now let's jump down to pedigree chart number four. We've already concluded this is recessive, and if I take a look at how many individuals have the trait, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven males. And we have only one female. Now, that's enough for me to at least strongly suspect that hey, this, this is very likely going to be an X-linked trait because we know that X-linked recessive traits are more common in females, sorry, more common in males than they are in females. But there's one other thing we have to look for. If we have a female with the trait, which we do here, individual 5-1, her father would have to have the trait in order for this to be considered X-linked. We look back at her father, he does have the trait, so that's consistent. So we have two consistencies here with it being excellent. One, it favors males over females, it's more males than females. And two, any female with the trait, the father has to have the trait. So we can now conclude that this is an X-linked trait. All right, so those are the recessive pedigree charts. Now for the dominant pedigree charts, we're looking for similar things. We're looking at males compared to females. And we're looking at um, relatives of parents and seeing what's going on with them. So if we take a look at pedigree chart number one, we've already concluded it's a dominant trait. Now, in dominant traits, they're the, if they're X-linked, they're the exact opposite of recessive traits that are X-linked. We expect them to be more common in females than in males. So in this pedigree chart, I have one, two, three females. And we've got one, two, three males, which means there's no reason for us to suspect this is anything other than autosomal. There's no reason for us to think it is X-linked. Uh, but just to be sure about it, there's uh, something else we can look for. Uh, not, only, not only should an X-linked dominant trait occur more frequently in females, but all daughters of an affected male and an unaffected female have to have the trait. And I don't see any instances of that in this pedigree chart. I don't have any instances where uh, an affected male and an unaffected female have even made it. Uh, if they did, all of the daughters would have to have the trait in order for this to be considered X-linked. So really, there's nothing in this one to tell us it's X-linked. So we can conclude that it is most likely dominant and most likely autosomal. Now, pedigree chart number three. In this one, we'll count up males versus females. So males, we have one, two, three, four males. And I count up females, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So nine females. So that's more than a two to one ratio favoring females over males. In a dominant trait, if it's X-linked, we would expect more females than males. That alone is not enough for us to conclude that it is autosomal, oh, sorry, that it's X-linked. We need something else. We need to look at the situation we were looking at back in pedigree chart number one, which was comparing uh, an affected male and an unaffected female. All the daughters would have to have a trait. So here we have that very situation right here. 
we've got an affected male and an unaffected female, and they have two daughters, and both daughters have the trait. Daughter number one, daughter number two, both have the trait. That's consistent. Now, it has to be consistent in every instance of that. So we have another instance here, individual 3-7 and 3-8, and they have two daughters, both daughters have the trait, so that's consistent. Um, we have another situation here, individual 1-1, one, 1-2, one, one, and they have three daughters, one, two, three daughters, and each one of them has the trait. Now, don't worry about individual 2-7, because you might say, well, wait a minute, 2-7 doesn't have the trait. They're the daughter that doesn't have the trait. But she is not the daughter of those two individuals. There is no connection here. They are not related. So that individual doesn't matter. Individual 2-7 is irrelevant. So I'm looking for any other instances where I have an affected male and an unaffected female, and I don't see any others uh, that fit that category. And the three uh, sets of parents that do fit the category, all the daughters do have the trait, which makes this an X-linked trait. So it's dominant and it's X-linked. So just to review, to figure out if a trait is dominant or recessive, we look for an individual who has the trait when neither parent has it. We can find even one example of that, it's a recessive trait. If we can't find an example of that, it's probably dominant. Next, we determine if it's autosomal or X-linked. We look at a recessive trait, we're looking for uh, more males than females with the trait, and we're looking for a female who has the trait, her father has to have the trait as well. And then we conclude it's X-linked. For a dominant trait, uh, to conclude it's X-linked, we need to have more females than males, and any affected male and unaffected female have to have all their daughters being affected. If that's the case, then we've got a dominant X-linked trait. All right, so hopefully that explains um, what you need to know about interpreting pedigree charts and determining the mode of inheritance.